Welcome to episode 239 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, well, this episode is not quite a case review, but still very much in line with my mission because part of my mission is to help writers create better FBI crime dramas. That's why I wrote FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, where I provide movie and TV industry tips for writing more authentic FBI characters. I think you'll agree that it's practically every author's dream to have their story made into a TV show or movie, and streaming services are looking for stories to develop. Traditionally, books have been an excellent source of materials, and now so are podcasts. Because of my podcast and FBI Myths and Misconceptions, last year I started working as a TV technical consultant. This year, because of my podcast and my crime novels, I've been working with a team to develop and produce a TV drama inspired by my career and family life. I have no idea if we'll be successful in selling the project, but the fact that I have this opportunity to pitch a potential TV show to studios and networks is absolutely mind-blowing. Now, I've heard with all the TV development deals and movie options floating around out there, there's like a 1% to 5% chance that my story will actually make it to the big screen, but I am certainly going to have a fun adventure, a blast trying to make it happen. But here's the deal. I may know about publishing books and producing a podcast, But this TV stuff is a brand new entertainment medium for me. So I've been asking questions, seeking advice, and gathering TV industry tips to help me navigate along this exciting new path. In this episode, I'll be sharing everything I'm learning with you. I want to thank retired agents Jim Clemente, Jim Fitzgerald, Bobby Chacon, and Scott Gariola all previous guests on FBI Retired Case File Review for letting me pick their brains about working in the TV industry as a producer, as a writer, and as technical consultants and consultants in front of the camera. In this episode, they generously share their advice with us. In your podcast app's description of this episode and on my website, jerrywilliams.com, in the episode show notes, there are timestamps marking when each agent's interview begins. I want to also invite you to be a member of my reader team, where once a month I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. There's a link to join my reader team in your podcast app's description of this episode. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. My first guest is former FBI profiler, Jim Clemente. Jim and his brother Tim's company, XG Productions, is responsible for the recent reboot of America's Most Wanted and for many other TV shows. Jim is also the host of two top chart true crime podcasts, Real Crime Profile and Best Case, Worst Case. Hi, Jim. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Jerry? I'm doing fantastic. That's I good. have to tell you, you know, we've talked before. I've been on your podcast and you've been on my podcast. But mm-hmm. when I learned that you were producing America's Most Wanted, I clapped and smiled <laughs> as if, you know, we were best friends because, I mean, who better to bring that show back, to reboot that show? than two retired FBI agents, because you're doing it with your brother, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Tim and I started XG Productions in 2009, and basically we did it to be a hub for former FBI, other three-letter agency people, police, military, people who've lived incredibly fascinating lives that everybody wants to hear about. So we created the company in order to, one, do good things with Hollywood's money and also 
to protect the people who actually live the lives and bring their authentic stories to entertainment across all platforms. So with those two things in mind, we started the company and we have a management arm of it. So we have a number of former agents and people from federal and state and local agencies and, and military branches. And we help them through the process of telling their stories and not getting taken advantage of. But when you're talking about America's Most Wanted, that was one of the things we wanted to do. We both grew up, we all grew up with America's Most oh, Wanted. Absolutely. And, you know, something like 1160 or 70 or 80 fugitives captured over the course of 25 seasons. 1,200 shows, 1,100 plus fugitives captured. That show did a lot of good. And we wanted to continue that, doing that good. So we approached Fox. We were able to obtain the license for the show. And we did a five-episode proof of concept. And we, we shot and aired five episodes. You can still see them on uh, Fox now. And in that time, we caught nine fugitives. Yeah, I heard that. That's yeah. fantastic. And that was just so amazing because... Not only were they people, you know, in the far corners of the United States, but we caught people as far away as Spain. So that's one of the things we added was the Interpol component, as well as new technologies. I mean, oh, yeah, the you, new technology was absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah, being able to see the people in three dimensions and our criminal avatars, it's so much better than an age progress photo. It just, it's so much easier. Seeing the relative size of the person, seeing how what they might look like, you know, if they if they aged well or didn't age well, if they colored their hair, if they wore glasses, if they wore a beard, being able to do all of that almost instantaneously to show that on the screen, I think that's what really got us that incredible result of of being able to catch nine fugitives in such a short period of time. So the concept still works. It does. You know, America wants to help and we're giving them the opportunity to help. And, you know, a lot of really great people who call in and give us literally hundreds and hundreds of tips. And of course, we, we have to vet them and send them to the proper agencies and then they go out and do their job and they've been doing it very well. Well, excellent. So has this success? Does that mean that you're going to have a season two? Well, yeah, we, we hope so. We're, you know, we're waiting. It's the process of filling in, you know, the time slot and all that kind of stuff. So, but we have at least 50 cases that we've already vetted and we're waiting for them to just give us the go ahead so we can get some more of these bad people off the streets. Now, that's very exciting. I guess we should go back to the very beginning and uh, talk about why you decided. I, I know you, you told us your mission and what you do, but why you and Tim, your brother? What was it that gave you the motivation to start your own production company? And you did this right after you retired, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, it actually started before that. In, in 1994, I had written a book and decided with a friend of mine who was a best selling author, Philip Friedman, to write. A screenplay about my story about how I became an FBI agent and that was I I was a prosecutor in New York and I went after the guy who molested me with the FBI and YPD joint sexual exploitation of children task force and we locked the guy up after I went undercover and wore wire and did all this and then after the case the agent Al McDonald gave me an application to the FBI I was like what he goes yeah you said you want to be a detective all your all your childhood. Well, FBI agents are just federal detectives. And I'm like, oh, wow, that sounds great. That's exactly what we talked about in FBI Retired Case File Review, episode 59, is that story. And of course, about how to prevent the sexualization and victimization of children. So anybody wants to hear more of that story, that's episode 59. But from there, I became an agent. I worked in the New York office, the Washington field office, Little Rock, Arkansas, and then back to DC. And then I did 
12 years in the behavioral analysis unit. Mandy Patinkin had come out in 2005 when he was considering joining the cast of Criminal Minds. And we met and we hit it off and I told him some stories and he said he wanted to base his character in Criminal Minds on me. And so he brought me out to meet the writers and the showrunner and the executive producers. While you were still in the bureau? Yes. So that means you didn't and get paid for any of that. <laughs> no, I didn't get paid for any of that. But I was recovering from a bone marrow transplant at the time. And I had to come out to California to go to Loma Linda Medical Center for a um, consult on uh, proton radiation treatment. And although they ended up deciding not to do it because I had kind of attained a certain level by that point and they wanted to treat me as little as possible because the bone marrow transplant is quite onerous a process. So anyway, Mandy had me meet them and I started telling them stories and they're furiously writing down stuff. And then they became the first episodes of Criminal Minds. And uh, eventually I became the tech advisor for the show. And then season two, I wrote my first freelance episode. But to actually specifically answer your question of why we started a production company, why I went this way after I retired, I wrote a scene for an episode of Criminal Minds called What Fresh Hell? It was about a case of mine. And in the scene, I recount Dr. Reed, Spencer Reed, says the statistics about child abduction homicides in the United States that came from our study that we did in the behavioral analysis unit. And he kind of does this thing we call revision, where he starts talking in the real world, and then he kind of walks through a green screen, and now he's into another reality at the crime scene or something like that. And as he's talking, he says, 44% of the kids who are abducted and killed are killed in the first hour. And now he's on a playground, and there's 10 kids playing on this playground, and then half of them disappear. And then... He says 73% in the first three hours, and now three quarters of them are gone. Then he says 99% in the first 24 hours, and there's one girl left swinging on a swing, and then the swing is swinging empty. And it literally made the hair on the back of my head stand up seeing that. Now, I had said those statistics thousands of times in trainings across the United States and around the world, but seeing it visualized that way and teaching. 18 million people, those statistics in one minute, it blew me away. I was like, this is a force multiplier like you can't imagine. And by the time it goes through syndication, it's something like 160 countries, 63 million people around the world watch it. So that just told me this is what I need to do with the information I have. And the access this will give me, I can help millions of people around the world understand the truth rather than just getting fed rehashed versions of what somebody thinks the truth is. I can actually be authentic and actually educate people while they're being entertained. Yeah, it's definitely a medium that allows people to take in messages that maybe they may not want to hear if it wasn't in that setting. Right. Yeah, they wouldn't seek it out in general. And this way, while they're being entertained, they're getting real statistics, real information. And that's one of the great things about Spencer Reed's character because he's, he's a genius and he kind of is a nerd and he likes spouting off statistics. And it's a way for us to get out exposition in the course of the episode without being too on the nose about it. So it's pretty cool. Now, a lot of agents who are able to work in the industry are satisfied with being technical consultants or writers, even though I think there's very few that are actually writing on uh, television shows or, or movies, but you still want it more. Well, you know, one of those agents who is now a writer is Bobby Chacon. And Bobby kind of went through the XG mentoring program. We first got him on uh, Criminal Minds Beyond Borders as a tech advisor on set, and then got him into the writer's room with me on the mothership, Criminal Minds. 
And then I wrote some episodes with him and got him in the Writers Guild. And then we went on to another show called Crime Farm and we wrote an episode together. So now Bobby Chacon is a full fledged member of the Writers Guild of America and he's writing scripts and features and he's done exactly what Tim and I proved could be done. And that is when you're an FBI agent or any federal agent or, or a cop or, or state trooper or person from the military, you've lived a life that many people want to learn about. And so your stories, your cases are your IP, your intellectual property. And one of the things that Tim and I set out to do was to become a hub to help these people who've lived extraordinary lives and careers protect their IP so that they're not just giving away their stories and letting other people make millions of dollars while they make pennies. And so our model is to get people into the writer's rooms, showing how incredibly detailed their information is, and then transition into freelance writing episodes, into becoming full-time writers, into producing, developing and producing their own shows. And one of the ways we've done this very effectively is to do audio series, audio, audible original series on cases where it locks in their IP. It creates something. Today, when you're selling a TV show or a movie, most of them are based on some underlying IP. And if you can produce that in a expedient and efficient way, you can tell a lot of your stories, not just giving away your whole life story, but one piece at a time, and then sell a show or more shows based on that IP. And so that's the model we've been using. Tim and I just did it recently with a podcast or an audio original series for Audible called Call Me God. And it was about our work on the DC Sniper case. And then we sold uh, the show to CBS Paramount Plus as a scripted series. So we're in the process of waiting. To, you know, COVID put us on hold for a very long time. So we're hoping to get that going. But the whole point is that we created that project, that audio project. It became a bestseller, was actually nominated for a Pulitzer. And now we can go out and sell that show based on that audio. So that they know what the story is. The buyers know what the story is. And they know there's already an audience for it. Now, what's the difference between doing something that, that you can listen to than somebody writing a book about their life? You're absolutely right. You could do it either way. The problem is writing a book is a much longer process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the writing, uh, the editing, and the publishing, and the distribution are a lot longer. And you can reach, you can reach literally millions of people with an audio project now because of podcasts and their popularity for zero dollars in distributing costs. Whereas books, obviously, it takes a lot of money to print those books and get them out there, right? So it's actually one of the reasons why podcasts have taken off. The other reason, I believe, is that when you just listen to something and you're not seeing it visually, I think it engages your imagination to a much higher degree. And I think it, it it's addictive. I love yeah. it. I love yeah. it. Actually, I, you know, I'm a, a big reader, but I don't read books anymore. I listen right. to audio because I can take them anywhere. Now, if I'm home, I, I'm one of those people that, you know, authors love because I'll get the ebook and the audio book and let the audio book read the story to me if I'm at home. But otherwise, you know, I know that I can continue listening you know, mm -hmm. in the car or when I'm, you know, taking my power walks around town. So I totally agree with you, which is the other reason that I do this podcast and I don't do video. Mm -hmm. Right now we're looking at each other, but normally, I mean, 98% of the time, I turn off the video because I find that the agents who are telling, you know, doing the case reviews and telling their life story are more open and uh -huh. they go into depth 
when I turn off the video. Because they're, they're a little camera shy if they have the video on, huh? Yeah, and then they have to worry about looking at me and smiling at me. And I want them to be able to sit back and remember what mm -hmm. happened, what they were feeling, what they were thinking. And I find it, it works out much better. Also, sometimes my Wi-Fi is shaky and it's better not to have the video mm -hmm. on. But really, I found out that it, it makes a better story. But you realize for me, I've kind of spent a little time in front of the camera. So I'm not, I'm right. not at all inhibited by that. <laughs> no, but it's, not, and it's also great for me, actually, you know, and, and I'm sure for you, you know, whenever we did interviews in the real world, when we were in the bureau, I mean, face to face is incredibly important. I mean, oh, absolutely. so much of communication is not verbal, but I do understand why when you're telling a story, when you're listening to a story, the visual actually is a distraction. And I think we're doing more and more. Now we're going into radio plays, you know, scripted dramas yeah. that are audio. And we're, I'm writing my first one right now. I love it. I just love it. Because anytime, you know, when you're writing a regular script and you have the action lines and description lines, they are a distraction. But when you're doing, you're doing this kind of audio play, radio play, the sound design and the the mood that you set with the the music and with the sound effects and the descriptions that the people have to infuse into their dialogue because there is no we're we're doing this without a narrator we're not taking you out by having a narrator tell you things it's it's really to me it's fascinating how our brains work and and how our brains engage when you're in that kind of a situation. So I'm hoping that it's successful because it's the kind of thing I want to keep doing for a very long time. Yeah, there's nothing better than as a, an author or a person who has a story to tell than the idea that it could be made into a TV show, a movie, an audible, you know, uh, Original, production. Right. Yeah, there's nothing better than that. It's extremely exciting. And almost everybody who has been on my show as a retired agent, you know, they have that story. And, you right. know, it would be exciting for someone to reach out to them. So my main purpose of this particular episode is for those agents, retired and current, and anybody in any walk of life that has a story that they want to tell. You are in the industry. What is your advice to them? What are some of the first things they need to think about when somebody reaches out to them and says, I want to tell your story? Okay. The first things they need to think about are a lawyer, an agent, and a manager. <laughs> because <laughs> each of those people has a different role. But you don't necessarily need all three, but each of them has a different role. And it's so important to protect your IP. Somebody reaches out to you and says, oh, I heard your story on this podcast. That's great. I want to do a show based on this. Chances are they're thinking of you as a source of information. They want to get your life rights and they want to write the story and produce the story and distribute the story. And they'll pay you something for your life rights or your story rights. But being an FBI agent or any other law enforcement officer, you know, I think you have a certain level of intelligence and activity and go get them. You know, you don't have to just sit back and let somebody do that. You can actually participate in it. You can actually develop and produce as well as sell your, your life rights. So you can be part of the actual production. And that way you can actually ensure that it is treated properly. And you're not just somebody that somebody's buying a story from. You're actually somebody who's participating in it. And I would encourage anybody, I mean, if you want to talk to us at XG, that's great. We have dozens of people that we represent. We kind of package everything together. Now, just so you know, lawyers typically charge 5% of whatever you make on the job. Agents charge 10% of whatever you make on the job. Managers charge between 15 and 25% of whatever you make. So if you do the math, you can see that things are going away rather quickly. I mean, you could have to give away up to 40% of your fees 
if you have a lawyer, an agent, and a manager. And that's a lot. So we do that for a much reduced fee of 15% for everything. A fair, equitable way for somebody to tell their stories will protect them, will get more than what they'll get on their own because most people don't understand the different streams through which you can get paid. Part of it is your life rights. Part of it is consulting. Part of it is developing. Part of it is producing. So you can have different streams of income and also have an ownership part in that rather than just being somebody who was being utilized and maybe taken advantage of. That's what our goal is. You don't have to come to us. There are other, there are plenty of management agencies. There are plenty of agencies. There are plenty of law firms. If you did want to come to us, we're at xgproductions.com and my email is jclementi at xgproductions.com and Tim is tclementi at xgproductions.com. And either of us can help you through that process or if you have something going on, we can help you figure out what the best thing to do. But the point is, what you have lived and the stories you've got in your brain are worth a hell of a lot of money to someone else. Why just give it away instead of actually participating in it yourself? So my best advice is to make sure you talk to someone to protect you before you tell your story to anyone. If you ever write anything down, it's very easy to register anything you write down with the Writers Guild. It's like $20 if you're not a member and you go to uh, WGA.org and you look for registering materials and you can register and put a secret code on it so nobody else can get access to it. And that gives you a date and timestamp of when you created this. So you always register something before you ever send it out to any producer or writer or director or anybody else so that you're protected. And there's other and how, things. And that, how does that protect you? Well, you can prove the date and time that you created this and that you own that story. That's yours. All right. If you write it down and you register it, you can sue them and get paid for what you did. And you have proof in the WGA. That's the kind of thing that you can do to help protect yourself and your stories. Before we leave, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about the FBI story, you know, the FBI agent story. You know, we see so many TV shows there. It's unbelievable. You know, once a month, I find a, a TV show or a film that features the FBI, and I go through it to let people know what was right and what was creative license, not necessarily as a review of it as an entertainment value, but because my audience is interested in the FBI, I just want to make sure they understand, yeah, that's really not how it works. And right. so the, many of them are shows that I absolutely loved and enjoyed, but that's not how it works. I know why I believe it's important to try to have some authenticity in the story when possible. But as a person who produces scripted and non-scripted shows, where do you stand on the entertainment value, which is extremely important if you're trying to sell a story? And how much importance do you put on getting it right? Well, that's a great question, Jerry, and that's the constant struggle for people who are tech advisors, writers, and producers who actually have lived the life, right? Been professionals in law enforcement. Many, many times I've been in situations, you know, we did 324 episodes of Criminal Minds over 15 seasons, right? And there have been many times where a writer, incredibly experienced, gifted writers, have come up with a story. And they said they want to write about this and, and do this and that. And what happens invariably is they'll say, oh, yeah. And I remember a scene in Miami Vice or a scene in, uh, you know, uh, Dragnet or One Out of Twelve, whatever it is, you know, they're come back. I'm telling you all the old shows, but they're, <laughs> they're, they're referencing more current shows. And so I want to do that. And then I say to them, you're rehashing. A lie. Some a writer cliche. made that up. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it has nothing to do with reality. Let me tell you how it really works. What you'll never be able to do is show how long and drawn out and boring a surveillance is. 
you'll never be able to show how much shoe leather you have to wear through in order to get all these interviews done. You'll never be able to show the administrative burden of putting together a search warrant or uh, an arrest warrant or an arrest plan. None of that stuff is going to make it into TV or movie because it simply takes too long and it will not move the story along. So you have to know how to fracture time and condense time. That's one thing you're definitely going to have to do. But you don't have to actually forfeit authenticity because most of the time, the real thing that happened is more dramatic and more powerful than something that somebody makes up. And, you know, there's all these cliches. Every character has to be flawed. So they want agents to do drugs, beat their wives and and break the the alcoholics. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there have been agents who've done drugs, beaten their wives and broken the law. And you know what happens? They're not agents anymore. And that is something that I had to constantly struggle with on Criminal Minds because they wanted them to be flawed. And I said, yeah, you just have to find the flaws that aren't illegal, that don't cause you to forfeit your professionalism. You can't be lying on the stand. You can't be doing things that would completely destroy your credibility. So let's let's look at the things that actually we can do. So I will say this. I became very persuasive in being able to get them to not make huge mistakes. For example, one time in one episode, the actors just decided that You know, we're saying psychopathy way too much. So we're just going to say psychosis sometimes and psychopathy other times. Two different things. (laughs) I know. They they have a lot of the same letters, okay? But that's where it ends, but not to them. So when I actually saw the cut, I was like, "What? what? What happened? That was not in the script. What are you talking about? But that happens sometimes. And so, you know, you got to be able to, You got to choose your battles, but you got to be able to keep it so that people aren't just throwing out word soup. And unfortunately, on some shows, it is literally word soup. And and another thing that's unfortunate is when people take such a liberty that it really undermines the credibility of the people who are actually doing the job. So I tried. And because Ed Bernero was a former cop, he was the first showrunner of Criminal Minds because he was a former cop. He was really careful about doing the right thing and and worked with me incredibly well in terms of that. And then Erica Messer, who took over after that, she did the same thing. So we were very lucky that there wasn't a lot of, yeah, there were some things that strayed every now and then, but there wasn't a lot of really blatant, absolute garbage that we put out on that show. And of course, Tim and I have consulted on dozens of other shows, some of them listen more than others. Let me put it that way. Excellent. I also wanted to ask for advice about what rights should they try to preserve? Well, the thing is, I'll use uh, Jim Fitzgerald as a perfect example. Jim has written four memoirs, continuing series. And when we sold the show Manhunt Unabomber, they wanted to buy Jim Fitz's life rights for that show. And we very carefully excised out literally one chapter from one of his four books and sold only those rights so that he could tell all the other stories before and after. If you sell your life rights to one project, they control your life rights for that period of time and you cannot sell any other stories. So you have to literally limit. They're going to want to buy as much as they can. You want to limit as much as you can to protect that story That particular case might go to them, but you probably have hundreds of other stories in your head. And then how you grew up, how you became an agent, what you did in the bureau, all those kinds of things. You don't have to sell them all that. So you want to really surgically remove the things that they're going to cover in that particular show or movie. And you want to be able to be free to do all those other stories in other projects for as long as you want. That's excellent advice. I want to thank you so much for being on the show. And Thanks sharing your Jerry. expertise with, with the listeners. Thank you so much, right. Jim. Take care. Next up is Jim Fitzgerald. 
a forensic linguist and former FBI profiler. Jim talks about what it's like to have a limited TV series produced based on a chapter in his memoir and the lessons he learned from that experience. Hi, Jim. How are you? Hi, Jerry. Great to be back with you. Yeah, absolutely. We were discussing, you know, what episode you were on, but it was very early. So definitely, it's it's good to have you back. I do remember those early days. You remember we actually talked about doing a terrestrial radio program <laughs> together, <Yes. laughs> and you were and you were very much uh, you were sticking with your guns. Yeah, Jim, I had this podcast idea. I think that's kind of the future. I did interview with with a person or two in Philly. And it, it just didn't work for me either. So podcast is definitely the way to go. So congrats. I think we're up around 240 episodes with me here. So congrats on a very successful show. Yeah, I'm sure one day we will collaborate on something because I think both of us are really interested in showcasing the FBI. And there's no better way of doing that than through TV or radio or podcasting. And I think we're both putting in the effort to make sure people understand exactly who the FBI is and what the FBI does. That's kind of been a mission of mine since my earliest years and some of the first interviews I was doing while still in the FBI. Of course, we had to get all kinds of permissions to do that. I remember the first time, I think I was on the streets of New York, some case I was working and my my eyes were like shifting a little bit and the producer stopped everything. It was being recorded, not live. So don't move your eyes like that. It makes you look smarmy. What? But, you know, because sometimes you'll talk to people and your eyes will float around. So you do definitely pick up a technique and a camera presence. But what's important, yeah, is getting out the positive word. Look, our former agency is not perfect. We both know that. And sometimes we have to talk about those things. But on the whole, the men and the women, agents, support, you know, analysts, everyone else, it, it's, it's a great team and a great family. And I know they're doing their best to do the right job out there. Absolutely. Now, for this particular episode, it's a little different for me. But I've been talking to a number of agents who are very interested in showcasing their own personal stories. And I think there's no bigger dream for anybody who's written a book, whether it's nonfiction or crime fiction or or memoir, to have that story turned into a TV show or a movie. I mean, that's the dream. Who wouldn't love that? And so that's why I thought it would be important to include you in this episode, because you had a limited series based, and I put quotation marks up, you know, based on your career. And so I thought we would talk about that. This episode is for anybody who has a story, a personal story that is picked up by the entertainment industry. Well, Jerry, what you just said has resonated with me for a number of years, but certainly since the original airing on the Discovery Channel in 2017 of Manhunt Unabomber. And as a reminder to the folks out there, it was first, pre- it premiered on August 1st of 17, and there was eight subsequent weeks in which the, the series played out. So you couldn't binge watch it at first. And it was very interesting watching my life sort of unfold on the screen, portrayed by an Australian actor of all things, Sam Worthington, but who did a great job. And I met him during the during the, the shoot and a, a good guy. And, and he had sent me a bunch of questions. He read all my books and watched all my interviews. So he really did his share of, of prep work. And, and I'm watching it air. And I got more active on Twitter and, and Facebook at that time, based on the discovery people you know, say, hey, Jim, you got to be, you know, social media presence. So I opened a new Twitter account, et cetera. And it's amazing the stuff that was coming out. I'm getting all these questions, some good, some neutral, some bad. And, you know, I would try to correct people and say, well, this is what really happened. This is what didn't. And finally, with the 25th anniversary of Kaczynski's arrest, just on April of uh, 2021, uh, I said, you know what? I have an idea. Let's put together what I thought was first going to be a limited podcast, but it actually turned into an audio book. And I hooked up with some producers out of Chicago and I, I did it from, you know, East Coast there in Chicago. And we put together the Fitz Files, Manhunt Unabomber. And it's all about the series. It's eight different episodes, which lines up with the eight separate episodes on Manhunt Unabomber. And we break down each one. And you're right. And, and, and my goal in putting Fitz files together was not just for true crime or FBI aficionados, but people who maybe wanted to be a director, maybe who wanted to be a writer, 
a screenwriter, a, a writer of true crime, and bring on people that I interviewed and, and try to uh, explain the process. Almost each person, I believe each person. So how did you start in the business? And now how did you move to this particular TV show, you know, Manhunt Unabomber? And we started putting it all together. And with all those eight episodes with uh, six different people I interviewed, including, including the set decorator and a prop master, they have some really interesting insights too. Not everybody has to be an actor or a writer or a director. There are, you know, 200 people involved in most hour long TV shows and certainly uh, a mini series or a limited series like Manhunt Unabomber. And I thought I'd bring in some of the more interesting people to just teach the rest of the world for the last four years now, give or take, from people. I thought, let me put this in the Fitz Files, Manhunt Unabomber. And it's, uh, it's had a very good reception so far. And it's come across well to multiple audiences. And that was my goal all along. Well, I listened to the Fitz Files. You know, I'm an audible person. So I, I use my credit and downloaded it and, uh, you know, listened to it. And I enjoyed it again in my quest to learn more about the industry, the entertainment, TV, movie, entertainment industry. I was able to learn a lot of things also from the Fitz Files about the industry. And of course, your own journey having this limited TV series made about your life story. So I want to go back to that part that I just mentioned where they say based on a true story, because in FBI myths and misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, towards the end, I write that one of the most important things for people who like to watch TV shows about the FBI is if it's a TV show or a movie that has the words based on a true story or based on real events, that doesn't mean everything that you're seeing is accurate. There may be things that the writer and the director and all those people that you introduced us to do to pull the reader or the viewer into the story. And sometimes that means that they eliminate facts and create alternative ones to make the story better. So what say you about that? Yeah. And I had a little bit of knowledge of that going into this process. This whole process really started for me like in early 2016. And if you listen to the Fitz Files, I know you did. You'll hear Jim Clemente's story, what, how he went through it. My good friend, Jim Clemente, of course, he hosts his own podcast shows and he's involved in XG Productions, which I am. And of course, we were Academy classmates in starting in 1987, which you you were my recruiting agent, as some people may remember from my books and what we've said before. And uh, you facilitated that whole process for me. But I met Jim and Jim and I, we were cases together. We kicked in doors together, made arrests together, but we both retired and got into the TV and movie land together. So that's interesting how that all played out. So thank you, Jerry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> But I had to let people know that I had that job as the applicant coordinator and recruiter with less than five years in the Bureau. They really were trying to recruit more women and minorities, and they pulled a basically brand new agent into that job. All right, so let's get back to the fact that if you're making a movie or a TV show, the most important thing is to present a compelling story something that's entertaining, something that's going to keep the viewers in their seats. Yeah. And a few quick anecdotes. As a young kid, one of my favorite World War II movies was The Great Escape. And I realized, you know, based on a true story dedicated to the 50, there were 50 escape prisoners who were killed by the Nazis. So I went and bought the book by Paul Brickhill and I'm reading it. And I said, where's this Hiltz guy that's on the motorcycle that jumps over the fence? I said, wait, wait I saw it in the movie. It must be true. Of course, that didn't happen. There weren't even any Americans in the real escape story. Years later, the French connection. Oh, based on the true story of French drugs coming in from Marseille, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, where's the car chase under the elevator? That didn't happen. Now, in real life, I was involved in, in 1989, you may remember this, the DEA agent that was killed in Staten Island, New York, Everett Hatcher, and this, this uh, muscle-bound steroid freak, Gus Faraci, a mob wannabe, was the one who killed him. And we went through this whole case, and the mob was hunting him, the FBI was hunting him. He winds up getting murdered by the mob, and the case is over. Two years later, a TV movie comes out, and we're all set to watch it that night. Here's a case I actively participated in, and we watch a two-hour TV series with Tony Danza playing the, the, the 
Gus Faraci, the, the, the criminal, the murderer. And, and the story was just so out of whack. And I remember I turned it off like an hour into it. I couldn't even watch the second half. FBI wasn't even mentioned. So I learned early on, not even in the business, how, how TV shows and movies will change even novels around. I mean, novels fiction to begin with, but a screenwriter will get it and they'll change multiple parts. So nonfiction or a memoir or a, or a biography, whatever, I found out screenwriters even do that. So going into this, I remember even talking to the director, Greg Utanis, the writer, Andrew Sadrowski, both of whom I interview in the Fitz Files, and they actually give good explanations. But I remember telling them up front, said, look, I'm aware of the concept of composite characters. Can't have every single Unibomb task force member being presented in the show. I get that. I also understand compressed time. You can't, you know, even eight episodes of a, you know, like an hour a piece, you just can't tell the whole story in anything even remotely like real time. So I knew those sort of shortcuts and, and sort of literary license would be taken. And it's interesting. One of the first things they came to me, Fitz, they called me Fitz, as my good friends do. Fitz, you weren't there for Kaczynski's arrest, but we want to put you on scene. I said, oh, no, no, no. That is the cardinal sin. You, you cannot ever talk about putting handcuffs on someone if you weren't actually there and you didn't do it. You will be chastised, besmirched, denigrated by your colleagues. I talked them out of that. If I wasn't at the cabin the day of the rest. I got there three days later. But what they did insist my character do is actually what no one did on the UTF, and that is have FaceTime interviewing Kaczynski. And I said this early on. When I read the scripts, I was mad. I didn't talk to the writer and director for a week. I wouldn't return their calls. This is all in, in my audio book, by the way, Fitz Files. But it was now talking to the people themselves is kind of interesting going back and looking at it. But I remember even saying, well, can you make this a dream sequence where it, like, um, Fitz is just dreaming this? <laughs> no, we can't do this. And the bottom line is they just wanted to bring along the storyline, the plot line. They had two A-lister actors in Paul Bettany and Sam Worthington. They wanted to give them scenes together. And I really had no choice. I had a written contract that was all signed. And I, I really had no choice. The only compromise was, look, I'm going to do media interviews. You want me to do media interviews to support the show? No problem. But I'm not going to lie and say, yeah, when I sat across the table from Kaczynski, you know, he said this, he said that. So no, we don't expect you to do that. You can say literary license, all that. So it was a very awkward beginning. And it's most people understood that, Jerry. Most people have enough common sense and knowledge. There's like two different agents that really didn't wear this very well. One guy wrote a couple of blogs about it. And I don't care if they like the miniseries or not. If you don't like it, that's fine. But they start taking shots at me while well, he wasn't even at the UTF in just a few weeks. I responded, finally, put all the stuff together. So to me, the overall show was very supportive of the FBI. Yeah, did we have some arguments? Well, we did in the UTF. Yeah, did some people not always agree with each other? Well, of course. No one always agrees with other people in life, even spouses. But I thought on the whole, it showed the FBI working hard, working together, and getting the job done, even with some personality conflicts therein. And that was my goal all along in anything I do, is to make the FBI look in a, in a positive light and to be a positive experience for people who are in it. Does that mean they're perfect? Of course not. If the whole show is about perfect people, who would want to watch it? That's why three years later, I was still getting the occasional email. Did you do this? Did you do that? I saw that in the show. Let's put it in an audio book. Let's get it out there. And we've had a very good response from it since then. All right. So in the audio book, Fitz Files, you do introduce this to people in the industry. But one of the really interesting things is that you go through, what did you call them? Your Fitz fun facts or five fun Five facts versus fiction. I'm into alliteration. I'm a linguist. So yeah, every episode, you do that on your uh, website. And I, I just watched you. What was the movie you did? The Clint Eastwood movie, Bloodwork. And I thought you did a very good job on that. Yeah, I just do those by blog. Yeah. And I thought I remember seeing that movie years ago. And that's kind of what I did. I extended, of course, with talking to the actual people in it. So the first like 15 to 20 minutes of the eight episodes is me breaking down almost scene by scene. But and you have clips. And I have audio actual, clips. Yeah, there. TV yep. show. And we brought those in and I'll play the clip. Like, All right. So that's what they did there. Let me tell you what really happened. And the writer was close here, but they really combined two things together. And I kind of explained how that happened. And and I'll refer to my book sometimes, of course, and how they, they took from that and borrowed from that. So, so yeah, each episode is broken into two parts. The first 15 minutes or so 
as the episode and, and taking it apart, not in a negative way, but just saying, here's what really happened. Here's what didn't happen. And they mostly got the FBI stuff right. The only thing I criticized them on, I think, was episode seven, when my character, the Fitz character played by Sam, walks into the cabin finally after the arrest. It's nighttime. And I did that. I, I asked to go in the cabin by myself. And you know they allowed me to do it, except he goes and he types on a typewriter. He picks up a piece of paper, no gloves. I said, oh, you got that wrong, guys. That's like the one sort of forensic mistake they made in the whole series. And I even had no problem with him picking things up or hitting like a typewriter key, but at least he should have been wearing like surgical gloves or something. But besides that, you know, some of the nuanced parts I, uh, I put together there for the listeners. But, but on the whole, they really got the job done pretty well because I was telling them what to do. I gave them my 300 slide PowerPoint with pictures and they did a great job in the cabin. That's why we talked to the, the uh, set decorator and the prop master. They really have an interesting job. Oh, it was and interesting. Yeah. And it's so much more difficult. They were saying doing a period piece from 20 years ago than like 50 or even a hundred years ago, because getting that kind of property and, and props, you know, people throw that stuff away now. Oh, I've had this old phone, you know, for 15 years, I'm getting rid of it. So they're the one stuff getting a hold of. And we're 50 and 100 years ago, they're antiques and people are collecting them. So I try to get a little bit of everyone onto the into uh, the Fitz files. And uh, I think on the whole, it presented a, a nice feel for the entire process. Again, we're going to try to use this episode to let people who do have stories that, you know, might be made into a, a TV show or a movie one day to kind of give them some advice as to things they should look out for, things that you know, may happen to them that they actually have no control over. So what would you say to somebody, and you know, who has a story? Because out of the 240 some episodes that I have, there are a number of agents in there who have books with options to make their books into TV shows and movies, and they're just waiting Hopefully they won't have to wait forever because I hear that happens too, but you know, for, for something to happen. So what do you say to them and the listener who may also have a book? Because I have lots of people who write books who listen to the show too. What, what's your advice to them? Well, I'll tell you, my advice has really shifted in, in the last year or so. And what I would tell any person who has that kind of sort of story to tell is put together a limited podcast and get your story out there. Podcasts are, as, as you well know, Jerry, are you know very popular nowadays. People are downloading them all the time. They may or may not be free, but you may have some commercials, whatever. But you can really get your story out there. And now a lot of these film companies and production companies and studios, they look and listen to these podcasts, see how many downloads, how many hits, what kind of popularity is in there. And if some agent tells this story... And it's really compelling, you know, and I mean, the production quality should be good too, and maybe team up with someone who's already done a podcast and get it out in a quality production. That's where the studios will pick up on things. You don't even have to necessarily write a book anymore or do a treatment. Now, a book doesn't hurt, or maybe a short story, you know, even a long blog on your own website and get it out there and let people know what your story is. And you may be surprised if it is in fact a compelling enough story you may have a writer, a director, a producer, you know, actors will sometimes pick up on a story and they'll try to option them themselves. And that's the first thing that happens is they say, we want to option your book and we'll pay you $50,000 for the option for three years. And all that means is this production company, this actor, whoever it may be, they own the rights to your story. You can't sell it to anyone else. Now you can then renegotiate that if it is made into a movie you know, the option then goes to a contract and you can get more money out of that. Didn't happen exactly that way with me. And as we explained that with Jim Clemente in the first episode of, of the Fitz Files, but sort of close enough there. So th that's what I would recommend. But you'd want to get yourself a, a literary or a Hollywood type agent. So not law enforcement, of course, but the kinds that can, you know, negotiate for you a, a deal you're going to work with someone, be a production company, another actor, whatever. And, you know, they'll get their 10% including maybe of a $50,000 option, but uh, they know what they're doing. They know how the contracts are written up. I read an excellent book. Of course, I can't think of the name of it right now, but I will put it in the show notes. It's a well-known author, and she says, don't use your literary agent. Get an entertainment 
lawyer, an entertainment attorney, because the deal, and again, I'm just repeating what I read in the book, but the the deal that is made by a literary agent, they're concerned about how much money you're going to get. They're not as knowledgeable about what the deal is. They're looking at the money. The entertainment attorney, they're going to look at the deal. You know, what do you have a right to do? What can you do? What can they do? And that is more important than the money. Yeah, and I may not have come across that clear, but I mean, if, if, if in fact you're going to go that route, I would say yes. You want to get someone familiar with contracts. They don't always have to be an attorney, but there are plenty of agents who are non-attorneys that still know what contracts look like and they can write it up for you. Now, if you, if you listen to Jim Clemente talk in my first episode, he realizes his agent kind of screwed him. And I even think even a, a lawyer, the way they wrote the contract up and they separated me from Jim and this Tony Gittleson, who was the other co-creator of the show. They finally got their co-creator credits on the show and some money, but you know, the Discovery Channel kind of played with them a bit. And Jim's, you know, one of my best friends. I got to know Tony well. And now here I am. I'm the golden boy as far as the, the you know, the writers and director, everyone's involved, but my friends are being put aside. How do I handle this? As I explained in the Fitz files, I even gave the money back at some point. I said, you know, in solidarity with my two friends, finally it was all worked out and and we took it from there. So it can get murky. You know, there's, a, there's an expression, you don't want to know how laws or sausages are made. Well, I think you may want to add to that limited TV series or movies because it can really get cutthroat and, and, you know, people can be hurt, you know, financially, things like that. On the whole, they treated me well. They knew they kind of needed fits to be there during the pre production, production and post production to do, you know, some of the uh, media interviews and stuff. They didn't want to piss me off. But I did let them know I was pissed off at some things I read in the script, also what they did with my friends. But we eventually got over that and I walked through everybody through that in the Fitz files. And, you know, there was some kumbaya time at the end there where, you know, we all did our collective man hugs and everything and, and it worked out well. I want to read a passage from FBI Myths and Misconceptions because I actually got a hold of an option agreement for the rights to one of the agents who had been on my podcast, the rights to his life story. And here's some language out of it. It says, it is producer's intention to portray option material as factually as possible with the understanding that the producer has the right to make changes. No approval rights are granted whatsoever in connection with any scripts created or motion pictures produced Hereunder, which rights shall be held solely and exclusively by producer and shall include without limitation control over all dramatic elements of said scripts and movie pictures and our television series. So basically, that agent has absolutely no control over whether or not he or the FBI is accurately portrayed in the series. And I think that's what people don't understand when they look at Manhunt the Unabomber. Let me explain something about that. We're talking about agent FBI and agent in Hollywood. So there's no agent in the FBI that's going to get that right of final refusal in a contract. Yes. You know, maybe if you're, you've done six or seven different series, you're successful, you may want to start your own production company, and then you can call your shots. But if you insist on that at the very said, no, we're not interested. Sorry, go find someone else. So you're not going to get that. There's there's a legal term for it, you know, right of last refusal or or total script control, something like that. It's not going to happen. No one in the very beginning. You're going to have to give that right up. The other important thing that I made sure I did get in there, they wanted my rights to my life story. And through my uh, agent at the time, I said they can have the rights to my life story strictly as it relates to the Unibomb case. A little before, a little after what happened during that time frame. As you know, I've written three books, A Journey to the Center of the Mind, books one, two, and three. And I tell my my early life, my Ben Salem police officer life, and the first 10 years of my FBI life. I didn't want to give all that away in this one contract. So I had to make sure that they knew you can have my Unibomb related life story. And yeah, there can be some flashbacks or flash forwards. That's fine. But you don't own the rest of me. So I can sell my life rights or these story rights or chapters, you know, however would be broken down to other other entities down the line. So there are two important parts. You don't want to give your entire life away, number one. And number two, you can try for some kind of script control or script approval. 
but the odds are you're not going to get that. Well, I don't know if you had an opportunity to listen to my interview with Joe Pistone. And uh, one of the things that he said was how angry he was when they filmed Donnie Brasco, that there's a scene where he beats his wife and he steals a bag full like five hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars. That never happened and it was very hurtful, made him angry, it was embarrassing, humiliating that they put that kind of stuff in because it wasn't true. And so he spent <laughs> you know, I, I don't know when that movie was made, you know, twenty I don't know how long ago it was. It's been a while. And he spent all that time making sure people know that he never beat his wife and that he didn't steal any money. And I think, unfortunately for you, you're going to be doing some of your Fitz fun facts versus fiction, you know, probably for the rest of your life, too. Well, it's funny. I have nothing like that happened in Manhunt Unabomber. But the one scene on a personal level that bothered me the most, they're trying to show Fitz. He's so dedicated, so obsessed with the Unabom case. But nonetheless, he takes his two older sons out to a movie one night, and they're like 14 and 11. I mean, they're not little babies. And he gets a page. Oh, we got this new document just came in. Can you come to the office? And Fitz goes to his two kids. I'll be right back. And the next scene is Fitz is on the floor with these papers all spread out, and his wife somehow gets into the FBI building. I never explained that either. It was like a Saturday night or something. And she goes, what are you doing? What do you mean? The kids called me from the theater. Well, that, I'll be right back. That was a half hour. No, that was four hours ago. So every interview I've done just about, you know, besides I didn't interview Kaczynski. That's like a professional thing. No big deal there. I never left my kids in a movie theater. I wouldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Yeah, I can understand where Joe Pistone's coming from with uh, being represented. I remember that scene, actually. It was quite a graphic scene. And yeah, if it happened bad enough, but if it didn't happen, even worse. So I understand where he's coming from. Boy, I would have argued... I wonder if he even knew about that. In, yeah, he uh, just happened to beforehand. be on set. He oh. just happened to be on set when it was being filmed. He didn't know they were going to do it. They just added, and he was fit to be tied. I would certainly understand that. Yeah, so these are some of the pitfalls that you know, folks who are, are interested in these types uh, of moving in the entertainment business. The bottom line is limited series, documentary, you know, movie, TV, special, whatever. Their one goal is to make money and to get clicks and you know to get people to watch it i understand that it's 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 the business world it, it is a business and they want to make their show entertaining and they will twist facts and, and make up storylines that just never existed i can live with twisted facts but at least have some basis of fact in there but the twisted part especially on a personal level like we just discussed with me leaving the kids in the theater of stone and slapping his wife around you know that 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 can be hurtful and and it can make it look, you know, bad on the individual. But hopefully, even with a scene or two, you know, a minor scene like that, you can get through it. But hopefully the the essence of the series or documentary, or whatever, will tell the story accurately and, and get the points across. Well, Jim, I really appreciate you kind of schooling us here about, you know, what it's like to have a TV show or a movie you know, written about your life story. I do want to encourage people who really want to know what part was real, what part was not, to listen to the Fitz files and to have an opportunity to learn more about, you know, the different roles of people in the in the movie and TV industry and in, in the film industry. So yeah, Fitz files. So Jerry, just so you know, my website, jamesrfitzgerald.com. People can go there and find a lot of stuff about me, but certainly about the, the Fitz files. We break it down by episode. There's documents, things in there that didn't quite make it into the audiobook. But also this summer, I was offering a special, anybody who buys the Fitz files, they send me an email with a receipt. I send them a signed poster. It's really a cool poster with the Manhunt Unabomber banner and my book cover and me. So I'm going to extend that into the fall. Send me that email and you'll get that free uh, poster in the mail. Oh, cool. Can I get one? <laughs> yes, you can, Jerry. Special delivery right to you. All right. Well, thank you so much. It has been a really fascinating opportunity to talk to you about your journey in the TV making business. I know you've done other things, such as being a consultant on TV shows. Well, I'm also not just in Hollywood. I am working cases. I am a forensic linguist and a criminal profiler. 
and I still get hired by businesses and others to look at different types of cases uh, that they have, criminal as well as civil matters. So yeah, I, I wear many hats, Jerry. Uh, besides the TV part, it's all enjoyable and it's all on my schedule, which is a good feeling. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. The book that I mentioned during his interview is Tips About the Film, TV Industry for Novelists by Christine Catherine Rush. I'll have a link to where you can learn more about the book in this episode's show notes. My next guest is Bobby Chacon. Bobby discusses his many roles in the TV industry as a technical consultant, writer, and on-screen talent. He provides candid advice about the entertainment business, option agreements and contracts, and salaries paid. Hey, Bobby, how are you? Good, Jerry. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. You have been on FBI Retired Case File Review four times. There's only one other person who's been on it four times, Judy Tyler, and she was she just made her fourth appearance. It's always an honor. Yeah, I don't know if you get a prize for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, always enjoyable to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, The first time we talked, we talked about your FBI career on the FBI dive team and and working uh, gangs in New York. And then the other two times we talked about the same issue that we're going to be talking about now, which is basically the FBI and books, TV and movies. But I'm coming to this one a little different. I'm trying to provide advice, not just to retired agents, who are going to be working in the TV and film industry, but other law enforcement officers and just anybody in general who has an expertise and a story and how that might be used, good and bad (laughs) term used, in the industry. So I guess we're going to start first with being a TV consultant because the advice that you gave me when I first started out doing this was invaluable. So First of all, how did you get involved in the industry? It was a surprise. I didn't plan on it. I I just, the only thing I knew going into retirement was I didn't want to work security. I didn't want to work in the private sector, corporate security world, although I had some very good offers to do so because I had other agents that I worked with that had leadership positions in corporate security jobs and stuff. And I just didn't want to do that for whatever reason. I don't begrudge that. It's a great field and some of retired agents are doing great work in that field. But I just, you know, my wife's a producer. We wanted to stay in LA. It found me, in effect. I was living in Brazil. My wife was producing the Olympics down there. And a email went around on XG Boys, I think, or one of the big listservs for retired agents. And it was looking for somebody in LA who lived in LA. And I, although I was living in Brazil, we knew we would be moving back to LA after the 2016 Olympics. So I responded to that email and I met Tim Clemente, who his brothers with Jim Clemente, who was a former agent in New York that I knew and became a fairly well-known profiler. And so they had formed a company called XG Productions, and it was geared towards not only producing content, but also helping agents transition into this entertainment world. And just like when I came into the bureau, the old timers kind of set the stage for you and kind of set an example to follow and and bring you along. That's what the Clemente brothers were doing. They were bringing people like me in who had no idea, even though I'm an attorney, I had no idea about entertainment law. I had no idea how the business works. This town very much works on its own terms. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's not, you know, you can't figure it out. But, you know, they brought me in and, and, and a number of others and still are bringing people in to the fold to kind of school them in how to do this work. And so they they brought me on immediately onto a show called Criminal Minds Beyond Borders, which was a spinoff of the what we call the Mothership, the main big Criminal Minds show. It only lasted two years, but it was invaluable experience for me. And a tech advisor, what's called an on-set tech advisor, is you're on set every day. You're working with the writers, the director, the actors on, you know, just bringing a little realism to it. And when I say little, I mean... You know, we're not making reality television. We're not making a documentary. So every single thing does not have to fit the way the FBI would do it. You're there to try to fit in as much realism and make it happen within the confines of working in that creative world between lighting and abilities and capabilities and camera angles. Certain things just can't happen the way you think they should happen. And so you have to go in with it with a very flexible mindset. If you don't, you'll be very frustrated. And I've had friends that have left the industry because they couldn't deal with the creative compromises that have to take place. You just have to understand that going in. The more flexible you can be and 
unfortunately these days with with social media and the like you know i see comments about i've even had some on my own productions that i've worked on where you know you see people say you know who the heck was the tech advisor on that show they didn't know what the heck they were doing you know and and i kind of shudder and i don't respond on social media you know and i'm saying well i do know what i'm doing and i tried to make the director you know, see it that way. But, you know, they, they had another vision for that particular scene and it had to play out in their mind the way they did. And quite frankly, the elements that they wanted to see overrode the elements that I wanted it to look more real. You know, I'm not going to win a battle. A tech advisor is not going to win a battle with a director. And so, you know, it, it is just what it is. So that was my first job. But, you know, they, they took me in, the Clemente brothers took me in and said, look, this is just the foot in the door type of thing. What you really want to do is you want to write because every agent out there and every law enforcement officer, in fact, every military veteran has stories and um, those stories have value and that's called intellectual property. And no one should be giving that away and no one should be taking it from you. And so one of the things they said when I was very new on the set was you'll be starstruck. You'll be looking around. I'm standing, I'm having lunch with Gary Sinise, Oscar nominated actor, and who's now calling me by my first name and we're trading cell phone numbers and you do get starstruck. And they said, what'll happen is the writers will cozy up to you and they'll just, you know, chit chat with you. And every story you tell them will be filed away in their filing cabinet and they will use for a future episode. So don't tell them that. Be friendly, engage them, tell them some stories, but your own stories, you want to make sure you protect. And even, even on set, you know, I know some unscrupulous producers and writers who will hire tech advisors and kind of suck them dry for their stories and sit them on set. And like I said, it's hard not to become starstruck when you're on set every day. It's a really cool world and you're watching magic happen. And you know, leakage, as in, you know, in the classified world, we talk about leakage and, you know, and that's what happens. You start talking and the more you talk, the more stories that they're just kind of, you know, filing away for themselves. And when a writer writes an episode, he's making, uh, I can't tell you what an episodic, you know, fees, depending on the writer, it could be anywhere from $35,000 up to $100,000 just for that one episode. That's in addition to his writing salary. Like you, I feel a lot of phone calls from retired people and you know, I walk them through the process and I get a lot of, I have this idea. I don't know if it would be good for a movie. And I'm like, I'll stop right there. Before you even tell me, I want to protect you. And I walk them through this process of, of registering their, their ideas because you don't need to write a full script to register to protect it. You can write an outline of a story, 10 page, 15 page outline, a couple of character descriptions, you know, a couple of plot points, how the story is going to go, what the world of your story looks like, you know, and in 10 to 12 to 15 pages, you can have the you know, a fairly detailed thing, and you can register that. There are a number of ways to register it. You can register with the U.S. Copyright Office, and you can go on their website. You can register it with the WGA, the Writers Guild of America, and they have a Writers Guild East and a Writers Guild West. I'm a member of the Writers Guild West, and they have different fees. I think it's $20 to register for members and 30 for non-members, something like that. But you can go on the WGA.org website, and you can follow the links on how to register. I mean, it happens all the time where people you know, hear a pitch, you know, I know, uh, I know somebody who pitched a very famous actor, a certain idea. And, you know, they said, yeah, it's interesting, but we'll pass. And then three years later, they're watching TV, and they see an ad for a movie, and it's the exact idea that they had pitched. And now they happen to sue. And because they had registered it with the Writers Guild, they pulled the script that he had written and given to this actor's team, this A-list actor's team, and they compared it to the shooting script of the movie, and it was about 85% match. So that was a very successful movie. And the writer who didn't have anything to do with it other than the original script got millions of dollars in, in an arbitration because that will happen. Um, people will take your ideas. But there are very simple ways to navigate and to protect yourself. You don't need necessarily an entertainment attorney, although at some point you should get one. I would say if someone's being a tech advisor on two or three shows or even one show, you might want to consider contacting a entertainment attorney and having you know a contract drawn up for you because... I remember one instance where I was offered, and, and this is an, as a tech advisor, this was an on-camera gig, right? So, you know, we talked about that too. I do some on-camera work for, you know, a true crime network. And how the network works is they have a production company. So, you, you know, some production company you, you never heard of. Although if you're in true crime, you'll have here heard of these same production companies over and over. And, and they contacted me and said, you know, that they, this is a typical line. They say, well, we don't necessarily pay our experts. We're like a news show. And I'm like, well, you're not a news show. You're, you're making a TV show and we're going to give you $500 for an interview for three, for three hours. And, you know, I said, well, three hours and just talk. It's pretty easy money, you know, but then I turned to my agent who I had just hired and he said, no way. 
your rate is, is $4,000 for an interview for three hours. So I said, well, I can't do that. And, you know, I can't, you know, they'll never go for that. He goes, that's what I'm paid for. So we go back and forth and he goes back and forth with them and, and they get up to $2,500 for three hours. And they say, that's it. That's, that's our bottom line. We can't go any higher. And he said, they are still playing a game and I want you to pass on this. It's up to you. Obviously, you're the client. And, you know, I, I said $2,500 with three hours. That's pr- pretty good. I just show up again. And he said, they'll come back around. And I said, I don't know. And I passed. And I had done a few shows already. So I was pretty confident that I could get another show, even if they, they went with somebody else. Sure enough, they went back to the network and the network knew me because of some of my previous work. And they said, we couldn't get Bobby. And they said, well, what's the, what's the gap? And he says, well, he wants, 4,000 and we're at 2,500 and they go, give me the other 1,500. And so they called my agent back and they said the network approved the, the 4,000. So I went from 500, which I probably would have taken to 4,000 for that interview. And I'm just thinking about all of the agents who would have taken nothing. Yeah. 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 And, and they will, they, I, I don't, I won't call them unscrupulous because they don't see themselves as, unscrupulous. This is just part of the practice and how they operate. If they can get something for free, they'll get it for free. If they can get it for dirt cheap, they'll get it for dirt cheap. I mean, it's all about budgets in Hollywood. It's all about keeping the budget low. But it's for us on our side, it's all about knowing our worth. Now you have a rate card. So my rate card was 4,000 at a time. It's higher. Now. And so the more you work in the business with each preceding show, you should be getting more money. And you may have, have to start to, out low. I have to uh, admit an embarrassing story. So when I started out consulting, the first offer that they gave me sounded great. You know, it was, uh, I think it was 1500 per episode. And so I said, yes. Do you know, they came back to me and said, you got a raise, we're going to give you 2500. Because right. they, I think, thought I was going to come back and negotiate. And me right. being new, I didn't negotiate. And I, yeah. and, and I learned now that the standard is 2500 per episode. I, For I, your first show. Yeah. I felt good, at least, that without me doing anything other than saying yes, they came back and gave me the extra right. money. So I, I did feel good about that. And it's, and the contract is an automatic raise for each season picked up. So yeah, the standard is about a three season commitment. If they get more than that, they're usually surprised. And then you renegotiate for season four if you're into it. Yeah. yeah. Or if you like it and stuff. Absolutely. 500 an episode is, is minimum. Yeah. And it's a much larger amount for the pilot. So yeah, I'm pleased. People have to understand there's different phases of the technical advising world. So when I said earlier, I was an on-set tech advisor. Right. So I, I I'm not on set. Yeah, I'm not on right. set. I'm not interested in being on set. It's a different world. And, and, and a lot of agents get this. They get phone calls or they'll get an email from a producer saying, hey, I have this script and I have this scene or two scenes in it. Can you just take a look? I'll send you the pages and take a look. That's tech advising, right? And you should be getting paid for that. No one should be doing that for free. You should be getting an hourly fee if you want to get an hourly fee, or you can get like a per project fee if you want. But they'll tell you, well, you know, I don't have much money. I'm writing it on spec and stuff, but men and women can do what they want. But, you know, that's work for you. And if you're giving that writer help with his script, that's a service that he would normally pay for and have to pay for. They will find somebody that doesn't know that and they will offer them something, but you should be getting you know, whatever your hourly rate is on script, script consulting. That's another thing I really don't like seeing agents taken advantage of when a writer will go and they'll try to downplay the whole, it's only one scene and it's six pages. And can you look it over? Well, they should be paying for that because that that's a valuable service in Hollywood. It's a kind of writing consultant. Yeah. And what would you say is a minimum hourly payment for that? $500 an hour. If you want it to go as low as 250 for the first one, but if you work with the same writer again, you should be at least $500 an hour for script doctoring or script, script consulting. I actually moved into writing consulting from tech advising on set. I moved into the writer's room at Criminal Minds when Beyond Borders went off the air and I moved over to the mothership for two more seasons and I was in the writer's room. So I was doing that, but I was getting a very nice weekly salary. And then luckily, and this is again, the progression of it. They let me co-write an episode before the show went off the air. And so that was what got me into the Writers Guild. So I always had a progression. I knew I, I wanted to learn what, what was happening on set, how a director and a writer interact with the cast. And then I wanted to see how a writer's room worked because ultimately I wanted to be a writer in the writer's room. So I was consulting. And then ultimately I got lucky enough. I worked for an awesome showrunner, Erica Messer, who allowed me to co-write 
an episode of Criminal Minds with Jim Clemente before it went off the air. And I used that to snowball into a an HBO Max show from Nicole Kidman, where I actually got into the Writers Guild and was a staff writer on that crime what, show. What was that show? That was show was called Crime Farm. And we wrote 10 episodes and it never got produced because of COVID. Now they have all 10 episodes written. The scripts are good. It's ready to go. Nicole Kidman is so busy, she probably won't make it, but she owns the script. So they're talking about her bringing on another ma- major actress to, to play it. I mean, they have everything done. They paid a lot of money for writers room for six months for us to put all the scripts together. And now it's just a matter of getting it shot. I don't know if they ever will. My job is done there. I'm on to other, writing other projects, but yeah, hopefully it, it's actually a very interesting story about two real, real people. They're, they're from the Netherlands and one is a criminal profiler. One's this DNA expert and their husband and wife, and they moved to Colorado and they, they kind of work for law enforcement agencies as consultants now in Colorado. And their big thing is they reenact crime scenes. So they'll, they'll reenact a crime scene. They have a farm. It's called Crime Farm and they have these big barns and they can actually to scale reenact crime scenes to see from different angles what may have been missed or maybe they'll come up with a different idea. And so we use them as a basic, basic. And then we kind of exploded their story. But yeah, but that was, that was the progression was. On set tech advisor to in the writer's room, kind of advising on the writing, more of the writing, and then then to being a writer myself, which is kind of where I wanted to be. And and so that's where I'm at now. We're actually pitching a comedy that I developed with Tim Clemente to HBO soon, and we'll hopefully have a comedy, an FBI-based comedy on the air soon. (laughs) It's amazing how many FBI-related shows are out there. Because each month I pick one, a movie, a TV show from the past or present to review. And there's just such a wealth of material for me to yeah. to, to take a look at. But, get, but what's missing, Jerry? What's missing in that world? Because that's what I hit on. What's missing is a comedy. Mm. How many of those are comedy, right? So think about what Bonnie Miller did in the old days for a police, you know, a detective room, right? And that was kind of updated with Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I don't know if you ever saw Brooklyn Nine-Nine. It's kind of the, the modern age Barney Miller, right? It's a, it's a goofy police station kind of cop show. No one's ever done that for the FBI. And, and I think they've been afraid to kind of touch the FBI because we, we hold ourselves out as, you know, a little up there, and, you know, and, and rarefied air, if you will. And, and so it doesn't demean the FBI. It doesn't, you know, degrade. It's because if you think about Barney Miller, it was fun comedy, but it didn't degrade people, right? Yeah. Um, and you know what? I'm, I'm thinking about all of the Miss Congeniality movies and Heat. And those right. were fun movies, very, very popular. But that female FBI agent, definitely, you know, it was a comedy. Yeah. That and our, 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 our lead is a female. And we're just trying to figure out who, who's going to play her. But yeah, it's interesting. And we brought on a big time showrunner to shepherd us through and he's going to help us write the pilot. He wrote on Seinfeld and he wrote on his most recent series was Veep and stuff. So he's got a lot of comedy chops and stuff. And so we're hoping that, you know, HBO or another network finds this a saleable project and hopefully we'll, we'll be by the fall, we'll be kind of in the thick of it. Well, I love the TV consulting. You know, I love being in the writer's room via Zoom and Mm -hmm. are just being sent emails and and being asked questions. And I don't want to be on set or or anything like that. But boy, I would love to be a consulting producer or something like that on, you know, a TV show. That's why the first thing I do is tell people to register their their product and their project and their ideas, because what you just said is, is, is really important. It's You want to own your own stuff. You want to be a consulting producer on something you've kind of created. You know, I have a a colleague and she was a former assistant United States attorney and she works with us creatively and stuff. She doesn't really have as much interest in writing, but she comes up with ideas and she drafts them out and she'll create a character profile. She likes more long form writing, like, like you with the novels, right? That's what she likes. So she's developing IP where she can write a novella maybe and then have that turned into a script by somebody else. But then she kind of keeps some creative control over her project. And, and that's, that's what has a consulting producer. That's what she'll do. She basically sells her story. At some point, she loses a little bit of that, but she retains it because it's her original story. And she, she has either the novella or she has whatever product she created. A lot of, a lot of TV shows are now or movies even are based on magazine articles. A long magazine, long form magazine articles are made into TV shows and movies now. But a lot of Hollywood wants an underlying IP. They want a novel. Or they want, you know, a Vanity Fair article, or they want something that they can kind of uh, look back on as their as the originating source material. And so 
you don't have to write a script. You can write a novel and, and then you can retain some of that by becoming, like you said, a consulting producer on the project. So when the writer who they hire to take your book or article and turn it into a script, they're going to be reaching back to you most likely. And you can, you can fashion that contract or your lawyer can fashion that contract so that you have, you know, you have a pass. You can, you have three passes or something on certain parts of the script and stuff. And so, yeah, a lot of that, a lot of that is the ability to kind of maintain control over, over your story. And you can do that. You certainly can do that without necessarily writing the script. My idea is I want to write the script, but, but there's plenty of people that don't. And we had a novelist in the writer's room at Criminal Minds and that's what he did. He, he used to say, I, I write novels because it's my passion and I write television shows because it pays the bill. Because, you know, he would write, he'd write a novel for two or three years and the payoff at the end was not exactly what he was making per episode as a senior writer on a network TV show. You, you can't argue with paying the bills. So your, your advice is to make sure that your intellectual property, your stories that you're being paid for those, just don't give them away. Do not, and do not give them away. And like I said, we, we know of a very famous TV producer who's, they have it down and they've actually told us this in meetings that they know they can invite a policeman or a fireman to set and introduce them to the cast and they get starstruck and then the writers will spend a dinner or lunch with them for a couple of hours and they'll have three or four different episode ideas just in a long dinner. It's a conscious thing on their part to kind of bring these people to set, show them around. And some people don't mind that, but you know, we're retired from the government. We're not retired TV writers making residuals. If it has value, you should get paid for it. And there are very simple ways. There are levels of protection, depending on how much you want to spend or how much time you want to spend. There are levels of protection, but certainly there's some basic steps to take. And, and like I said, go to the Writers Guild websites, go to the Copyright Office, the US Copyright Office website, work your way you know, through it step by step. You know, We have lawyers in-house at XG Productions that, that kind of can represent people. They want an entertainment lawyer. Entertainment lawyers generally take 5% of what your overall contract is going to be. You know, there's a difference between an entertainment lawyer, an agent, and a manager. Those are three very distinct jobs, and you don't necessarily need all three. But certainly, you should start with an entertainment lawyer that, that looks at your contract, because there are certain things that are very easy for them to spot, but very difficult for a layman if you, you, you've not done this kind of law before or in this kind of area before. You know, an entertainment lawyer generally, like I said, will take 5%. It's worth it, particularly if they can, you know, protect you. And now there are many producers that are honest and will treat you fairly. But there are a lot of sharks in this town, too, that, you know, will not. And so you don't know who you're dealing with until you deal with them. And, and oftentimes, it's too late <laughs> by the time uh, you realize you're dealing with someone that's not particularly above board. So it's always good to protect yourself. So there are, there are ways to protect yourself before getting a lawyer, like I mentioned, with the Copyright Office or with the, the Writers Guild. And then when, when you actually get into the nitty gritty where, you know, they want you to literally start working either from home or otherwise, I think it's time at that point to to maybe consult an entertainment lawyer. Well, Bobby, one of the things that I have heard, I've reached out to people that I know have a book about an FBI case, and they tell me that they can't even come on the podcast because they've sold their right to the project to a producer. And they may talk about the, the book maybe in a newspaper or a speech, but they can't do any type of recording. Yeah, the world of options is really kind of another minefield that happens when somebody writes a book. I mean, obviously, it's it's great if somebody wants to make a movie out of your book or a TV series out of your book. That's that's like nirvana, right? That's the place you want to get to, and it's very it's very lucrative. They dangle easy money to you, and you're like, I don't have to do anything. You're just going to give me this money. Yeah, well, that's all it is. But then, if you're serious about getting it made, then you really want it to with a producer that's really going to make it. But the problem is, for example. There could be a studio out there that has a similar project to what your book is about. For example, this is just a hypothetical. And if they get wind of your book and, you know, you, your agent or you're shopping it around and you know, they have a synopsis of what your book is and it's similar to a project that they've already invested in, they will go out and buy your option. They will spend money to buy your option simply to put your book on the shelf. And they'll buy it for a three or five year option knowing that their project is going to be out in the next two to three years. And it's, it's going to be so similar to yours by the time you get the option back and they have no intention of making it. They just want to get theirs out first. Now you're pitching your book again and they already have their project out and it's too similar, right? So you have to be very careful with options. You have to make sure that whoever's buying it really, really, really intends to make it. 
a good entertainment lawyer can build into your option. First of all, the length of the option is really important, right? You have to be able to get it back. And then there are criteria, there are thresholds, gateways that they have to meet or else the option reverts to you. And so a good entertainment lawyer will set up hurdles that producers should be going through if they really intend to make it. There are time limits on doing certain things, time limits on getting a pitch document together, time limits on scheduling pitches. They need to be pitching studios and networks if they're serious about this, having you as the writer in those pitch meetings and things and stuff. So so if they don't have, say, a pitch document by a certain date, it reverts to you. So an entertainment lawyer will know those threshold activities that a serious producer who wants to get a project made will go through. And if they're not going through them in a certain timetable, it indicates that they're not really serious about it, which is fine then the, the right should revert back to you and you should be able to sell it to somebody else. That's great yeah. advice. But, you know, and, and I will say this, sometimes an idea is hard to sell, but that doesn't excuse the producer from trying to sell it. So at the end of a certain period, 18 months, two years, three years, the reversion right should go back to you and you should be able to try to sell it to somebody else who may have a different take because, you know, a producer could buy it from you, but any good producer has three, four, five projects going at one time. And when they bring yours in the door, that doesn't mean one of their other projects catches fire and now they lose interest in yours or they don't have the time to dedicate to yours. Well, you need to get those rights back because you need somebody that's going to be pushing for your project from day one. And and if it's sellable, it should sell right away. And if it's not, then it's going to be a harder road, but um, at least somebody should be trying to do that. All too often, options are a way to sit something on the shelf and build a library of IP. So a producer gets an overall deal. Look at all this IP I have in my name. I have the rights to all these things. Yeah, but every right that that producer has is someone else's right that's been taken away, right, to sell it somewhere else. So really be careful about that. That's even more important time to consult an entertainment attorney because an option can be drafted to protect you, the content producer and your intellectual property. And there are certain things that can be built into an option to kind of hold the producer's feet to the fire about you're serious about getting this sold or getting this made. Excellent advice. So let's touch on just briefly the other aspect of your work in the industry, and that's actually being a cast member. And I I remember Joe Del Campo, I I knew him from Philly, was on Survivor. And you had kind of uh, an experience, or you were, I guess, still in the middle of such an experience of being on an unscripted Survivor-like show. Yeah, I, I had done several true crime shows in the past, and then I got picked to be on this team of six kind of adventurers. And we went down into the jungles of Brazil and Peru to investigate a case. And the case is this, four people were killed. Two bodies were found, two bodies were never found. Three of these four were people who had uh, read a certain book called The Chronicle of Acacor. And by reading that book, it really uh, stirred a passion in them to go down into Brazil and to look for this lost city, this subterranean lost city, way deep in the Amazon that is described in the book. That show is on Discovery. I, I think it's made its run, but it's probably on Discovery if you go, or go online and watch it. It's now, it's also on History Channel in Europe is, is, is broadcasting it starting this month at some point it's called The Curse of Aquacore. And, you know, we went with a crew deep into the Amazon where very few people have ever gone. We, we came across these tribal villages that I don't think they've ever seen people, certainly with my skin tone. And, and, and they were, you know, very surprised and very friendly and things, but it's a fascinating case. I would love to do a season two. We don't know that we'll get one, but, you know, right now it's, you know, people watching it. That's pretty cool. Well, to sum everything up, what ending advice would you give to people who have written a book and who have a story who are interested in getting into the entertainment industry? Reach out to people that are already in the business. There are some really valuable lessons to learn and and good direction, and they can set you up with maybe attorneys they know or agents they know or, or ways to protect yourself. We relied on each other, you know, when we're inside the bureau, and there's no reason that we shouldn't be relying on each other now when we're outside the bureau. Absolutely perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In case you're wondering, I have no association with XG Productions. I just wanted to bring you advice from guys I know personally who know what they're talking about when it comes to the TV industry. My last guest is Scott Gariola. Scott was previously a guest on FBI Retired Case File Review to present a case review about his Chippendale murder for hire case. Scott is currently a technical consultant on some of the most popular FBI crime shows on TV, FBI, FBI Most Wanted, and Clarice, along with All Rise. Scott shares how he got into the TV business. 
Hey, Scott, how are you? Hi, Jerry. I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm doing great. You know, a lot of times listeners wonder, you know, how I find my guest. And I actually learned about you because I did a review of the new hit TV show, Clarice, on CBS. And one of my agent friends let me know that you were the technical consultant. And, you know, the summer of 2019, I, I was trying to figure out what to do. I knew I had to retire. I wanted to work for about five more years. I have a young daughter. And so I started looking at job offers. And then out of the blue, I get a call from this author. And all I will say is that he's written a book about the FBI and he wanted me to do a podcast with him about it, a certain topic, nothing to do, not competing with you. And I said, well, yeah, I said, that's interesting, but you know, it's not something I'm going to do while I'm working. You know, maybe if I retire, we'll talk about it. And then a friend of mine who is in the entertainment industry called me and said, Hey, I, I sold this show and I'm looking for a tech advisor. I'll send you the script. So I read the script, great script. It's a show called All Rise. And it was about a state court judge and the state court system. I said, I said, it's not really in my wheelhouse being an FBI agent, even though we're working fugitives for two decades. I probably did more state court cases than anything. I said, but it's kind of interesting. I mean, you know, things are kind of like popping up. You know, maybe something will happen. So, well, you know, I know the executive producers of the new show called FBI Most Wanted, which, you know, is a show about an FBI fugitive team. Yeah, definitely that one was in your wheelhouse. <laughs> that, that one was right in my wheelhouse. So I went and met the executive producer. He pretty much said, when can you start? You know, he said, we need somebody desperately. He says, by the way, he says, the other show, what they call the mothership FBI, which is the first show in the, the series, they need one as well. So I went and talked to that executive producer. When can you start? And this is like August of 2019. I said, well, I have to retire. We can't have additional employment as we're working as FBI agents. It's just one of the rules. I said, well, maybe this is a sign, right? All these opportunities came up at once. Talked to my wife. I said, this is probably probably the time to retire. I had 31 plus years at the time. So I pulled the plug and I started becoming a technical advisor on all those shows. And then right around that time, I was called from another executive producer. They were doing a show about Clarice Starling, the hero of Silence of the Lambs. And they were trying to sell a show about that. And that show takes place in 1993. And that's right around the time I was a a young FBI agent working, working cases. So I became the tech advisor on Clarice, which is a sh- uh, another show on CBS. And that's what I've been doing. It's definitely a different world, but it's great. I mean, you know, you get to meet, talk to all these smart writers and executive producers and kind of always been an interest of mine during the, during the mid nineties that my friend who developed the all rise show, he, he actually developed a show about the FBI. And I know you know the show called C16. Yeah, I did a review on that show. I, yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, that was mid 90s. And he wanted me to, the same friend wanted me to be the tech advisor on that show. This is 96, maybe 97. I told him, I said, hey, you know, I've got a scholarship here at the FBI for about another 20 years. I said, unless you can buy out my scholarship guarantee, I said, I can't take a, a chance on leaving the FBI for a show that may last only 13 weeks or whatever. So, you know, I helped him initially, you know, kind of on the side. We're just reviewing the script and giving him a couple of pointers. We can't get paid for that kind of stuff at the time. So, the, yeah, but the show went on the air, and I think it lasted about six or seven weeks. Great cast in it, but, you know, it's, it all comes down, as you know, it all comes down to writing, good writing and executing well, I guess. Yeah, well, I watched the show, and I enjoyed it. I think it was probably ahead of its time. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right, because it's kind of like it was like a precursor to the FBI show. You know, kind of exciting drama every week. And just a, just a great cast. Eric Roberts, D.B. Sweeney. Boy, I forget the other actors, but everybody in that cast, you, you know somebody today. Right. Harmon. Uh, Harmon, what's her, what's her first name? Well, I forget her. And, uh, <laughs> great, great cast. Great yeah, cast. Great cast. Oh, cool. Well, as you know, I've mentioned to you that I was contacted because of the podcast and the book that I wrote, you know, FBI Myths and Misconceptions. I was contacted in the same week by two different production companies. And so right now I'm the technical consultant on the new show that's going to be coming out from J.J. Abrams and then another show that FX Networks, which is owned by Disney, is doing that has not been officially announced yet. So I I can't talk about that. But yeah, it's interesting work. 
The thing that I like to stress is that we're the technical advisors, so we can tell them how things really happen in the FBI. But of course, the bottom line is the story. That's the most important thing. And they don't necessarily have to <laughs> take our advice as to how to make something authentic. And thank you for saying that, because all the friends of mine who watch the shows that I work on, and they tell well, that's not what we do, or that's not how it was. Or, well, you know, listen, you know, we get paid to consult and advise, but ultimately it's up to the, the writer and then the executive producer and then the director to, you know, drive the story and make the, sh- the story dramatic and interesting. So it'll take us eight months to, you know, get phone records back in the early 90s. You know, they could get in a matter of hours or you know, DNA in a matter of hours. You have to compress everything, right? Right. And I think also so, it's the, the, the danger during a TV show that's placed on the main FBI hero. Right. If we had to, every few weeks, be captured and kidnapped and tortured. Getting shot or shooting yeah, somebody. I don't, I don't think many, <laughs> many people would uh, remain in the, in the bureau. <laughs> exactly. Be way too dangerous of a job to, to have, but yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's, it's fun. You can do it remotely too. That that's what's good, right? Because yeah. like me, I mean, you get a script, you sit down, you get a, you, you may get a, a teaser of the script, and you get like an outline, and you get the uh, actual uh, script itself, the dialogue, and then you'll get revisions on the script. So you kind of see it develop and progress along, and that's and that's where we come in with the writers, right? You know, they may have an outline of a story, and then we have to tell them, oh, that really wouldn't happen, or maybe change this, and you know, you probably should say this on the radio or this time. So right. and that's, and that's that's what we do, and. But ultimately, it's up to the director and the executive producer and the actors, too. They have, they have a lot to say, too, what feels comfortable and natural and normal. Yeah. And for me, since I'm writing crime fiction myself, you know, it's an opportunity for me to be in the same room, even if it is virtually, with, you know, seasoned TV writers and to really learn the craft. So I'm having a blast. Mm-hmm. It's, it's fun. It's not what I envisioned my post-bureau career, but it's, you know, all the same. It's just as exciting because the pandemic didn't have to go on set at any of the shows. I don't need to be in New York because they have on-set consultants. The Clarice show, I'm hoping maybe next season, if there is another season, hopefully there is, uh, get to go on set there. It's just a, it's a lot easier when you're on set to kind of see things than when you're reading it from the paper, I think, how things play out. Yeah. I definitely like uh, being consulted and, you know, answer some questions about, you know, how the FBI really would do something. So, right. yeah, so that's, that's fun. And that's, I'm, I'm glad I had an opportunity to, to speak with you about it. That's all I have to say. You mentioned that you were contacted because you had a friend in the business, but your brother was an actor. So I thought maybe that was the connection. No, no, my, my brother. So I came out here. I went to UCLA, started in 1980. My brother had come out here to Los Angeles from New York in 1976. So that's how I got out here because I'd come see him on spring break or vacation. And I said, man, this is the place for me, right? I'm going to leave the Bronx. And I only applied to two schools, USC and UCLA, when I was graduated high school. Got into both of them. I chose UCLA. So that's, so yeah, my brother, when he came out, he wasn't intent on being an actor. The job that he came out for originally didn't pan out. So he eventually got caught the acting bug like so many people do. And he's been acting and making a, you know, making a living out of it since, you know, the mid seventies. And, but he's, you know, he's an Italian guy from New York like me. And uh, he always plays the, the heavy or the bad guy on TV. So. And what's his first, name? First name is Sal. Last name is Landy. He doesn't use our last name because Gary Old is a little too complicated, I guess, for the screen. So he uses my mom's maiden name. Thank you for being on the show. Scott was great. I recorded my conversation with him before I developed the format for this episode, so I didn't ask him for advice during the interview, but I emailed him and he provided a few words of wisdom on how you might prepare for a more strategic entry into the technical consulting field. He wrote that being in LA or New York was helpful in being introduced to people in the industry. He also thought, especially for those in law enforcement or military, that having a good reputation, working on some high-profile cases, and developing an expertise, which in his case was working fugitives, violent crime, and in a task force environment for over 22 years, definitely helps anyone interested in being a technical consultant get noticed by the industry. However, he does acknowledge that even more than what you know as with many opportunities, it actually can boil down to who you know. 
at jerrywilliams.com and the show notes for this episode. You'll find a photo of all of my guests, images from a few of the shows they're associated with, and links to their websites. There are also links to their previous FBI retired case file review episodes. And don't forget, there's a link for that eye-opening book by author Christine Catherine Rush that I mentioned during the episode, Tips About the Film TV Industry for Novelists. It is a must-read for authors and podcasters hoping to turn their creative content into a TV show or movie. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And make sure you follow FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.